Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, my illustrious family. I want to welcome you, first of all, to the mental house with me, your host, Kadu. Y'all, um, I must admit, I have been traumatized over the weekend, um, I guess maybe for the last four days. And I think it's time that I share it with y'all. Now, everybody experiences is not my experience. But I did a, a, a video about this on Patreon. And... Um, I want to do it and clean it up as much as possible and do it again on YouTube. Uh, and it's very important that y'all understand that religion, it really is the opium of the people. I think Karl Marx said that and y'all got mad. But you know, I believe it to be true. I was traumatized by listening to um, barbershop conversations. Most of these people I knew, I grew up with. Um, you must remember, I was like five years old when Malcolm X was uh, assassinated. I was also a member of of the Nation of Islam when Malcolm X was assassinated. I have been very, 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 as the other members of my family, very much traumatized by what happened to us as children. I was born, uh, well, just pretty much 1960, okay? The last of the years, I born 59, actually. But I started to come into the scope of what was, you know, children are in the beta mind state in terms of how they think. So while I couldn't rationally put together what was happening to my family, I knew it was being destroyed. And I can't explain it through the eyes of a five-year-old. My home was being destroyed because of what happened with Malcolm X. Okay, let's deal with this. Uh, I haven't talked about this because it's too painful. And not only is it too painful, there's too many things that make you say, please, just please. So today, in my understanding, I don't deal with any type of organized religion, any type of, type of cult, because that's pretty much what happens when you are involved with something that is that huge, that powerful, and that controlled. It has become a cult. Now, like I told y'all before on another video, my father was a minister. And he had a very close relationship with Malcolm X. In terms of my father being from Indiana, him being from basically born in Nebraska, but lived in his family, lived in Milwaukee for a little while and on Walnut Street, I believe, or something, but also being Garveyites. Okay? So my father was totally, totally, totally as most young men, and I, I always keep that in mind, that these men were so young, it's almost like Tupac and me. Pac was dead before he was 25, or at 25, so I wanted y'all to get a little perspective for this as well. All these men were young, and which is not an excuse, but it is a reason. Okay. So, what I experienced 
was a bunch of young men basically feeling their way through, latched on with a uh, organ um, organization or that became very powerful. Especially for black people, because we've been looking for something to take us out of our misery and not meaning death. Um, and Elijah Muhammad presented that to us. Marcus Garvey, he ripened us up for Elijah Muhammad. Now, with that being said, my father was also the son of a preacher man. Okay? His father and his father before him and his uncle, they all come from a line of bishops and pastors. and So he was already right with the religious bug. Okay? So my father didn't smoke. He didn't drink. He was a very disciplined man. I can stand here and tell you today I have never seen my father smoke. I have never seen my father drink. Um, same thing with my mother. I've never seen them engage in those type of uh, behaviors. So they were an example to us, first of all. And my parents were married, in my opinion, way too young. My mother was 18 and my father was like 20. However, it is what it is. Um, and this is what I remember. I remember my father being totally up in arms, coming into the temple, no, the church at that time, because we were we were in church, we were fluctuating back and forth because Malcolm had left the nation. Some of the kids I played with and talked to growing up and stuff in Chicago, I couldn't talk and play with them anymore, and there was actually a dark cloud hanging over my friend that I thought at um, uh, uh, um, at the temple, temple number three. I know y'all call it the mosque you now. So if I say temple, that's what I mean. That's what we called it back then. So my friends, like Hamda and Khadija, uh, Miriam, there was a lot of individuals that I grew up with. And because of what was happening in the nation, we all had to separate. We could not speak or be friendly with, upon one another. So as kids, you don't understand all the dynamic. But what I did understand, understand was the day my father was traumatized, walked in that church and said, get out of here right now. They done killed Malcolm. Let's go. They done killed Malcolm. Now, I remember those words as vividly as I remember it as if I was reliving it and seeing it um, today. My father was crying. I'd never seen tears. He wasn't exactly crying, but I would say tears rolled up in his eyes. So, yes, he was. He was crying. He Tears was going down his face. I didn't hear him go, uh, 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 like that. But I saw the tears coming down his face. And my mother likewise was in shock uh, because she had to gather up her children and get up out this church right now because Malcolm had been killed. Now, the reason why I say for me it was so traumatized and not just because I wasn't able to play with my friends anymore, my father eventually left and became a representative of Milwaukee Muslim Mosque Incorporated initially. But I always say religion split my family down the middle because after Malcolm's assassination, my father totally lost his mind. Totally lost his mind. Okay? So it was too much for him to process as a young man. It was too much but they were all young men. It was too much backbiting, oh, just this horribleness going on at that time. Okay, from what I remember, my mother and father. Now I begin to see them argue 
arguing all the time. I, while I've never seen him hit her, the fights were so uh, just emotionally just, uh, you know, devastating for us as a family because we always walked up right. We always um, trained. We had discipline because those are the things that the nation taught us. And while we didn't get that from church, and my father was already ostracized because he had left the church, because we were all talented musicians, my mother still thought it best that we get the chance to go to church so we could have practice on our skill, which in the nation of Islam, you could not sing, you could not, because Elijah Muhammad thought that, you know, we did too much song and dance, not not thinking that, you know, this man is rich and, you know, I'm saying this for all of us now as we get older and how dare you put a clamp on how people are, are, are um, how do you say it, creatively inclined. God give you a gift and he put it in you, but because of this man, nobody can't use it. These are all the things I'm starting to see as I'm growing up. Minister Farrakhan is one of the most talented violinists you've ever heard. A lot of people don't know that. They started to find out that he, the man was great. And also playing um, the ukulele. He was a very talented, creative musician. But he had to stop that under the tutelage of Elijah Muhammad. My mother never, that never sat well with her. But what really sat worse was all the friction and backbiting. And now my father is beginning to, or well, probably was the whole time, because like I said, I was very young. I was five. Having other women because it's okay, because, uh, you know, you, you, you can have as many wives as you can afford. Um, it was supposed to be for the rank and file, but everybody was in, involved in those type of extracurricular relationships. And I dare anybody to say that they wasn't. They took the women through hell, broke the women's spirit, made the women have to deal with stuff that they never would have to deal with living in America, but yet and still you're saying we should obey laws. It, you know, you can't have it both ways. And the nation of Islam, in my opinion, was the biggest mind screw that a person, that, that, that my family ever got involved with. And I'm just going to keep it real with y'all. The church was crazy enough. But it, once you got a little bit older, you could already decipher that madness. Because all of it is have all these mystical, crazy-ass stories. Daniel caught in the lions in the... Uh, Daniel in the who was it? Jonah in the belly of the whale, and Daniel in the lion's den, and all these crazy ass stories that you have to be a damn nut to make yourself believe. And those of us who were forced, because like I always say, children are in hostage situations. They are forced to deal with this type of shit and try to make some kind of rational logic because your parents are dragging you there. Even when we went to the masjid, to the temple, and one of the ministers we had there was uh, Henry X at the time. Uh, Henry X was a gangster. Henry X, oh, similar to what happened in the nation 20 years ago, when you had the same element running ramshot over the nation so much that they were... Um, involved in assassinations and all types of stuff. So the Nation of Islam has always been a gangster element involved. I didn't know that until I got older. And what they did to Malcolm, what they did to Malcolm, I started to put the picture up that 25, well, well maybe 40 years later, when I had a chance to meet with Farrakhan at Rabinia in Chicago. 
that was the first time that I had actually seen him since I feel like they destroyed my family. I smiled because we prayed together. And the prayer was to let me find forgiveness and peace. That's why, even though all that stuff was going on, at the end of the day, I still believe that Farrakhan was misled. I believe those brothers at the temple in New York, Newark, uh, tricked him. I do believe that. To make it look like that he set the thing up. I don't believe he did. But again, who am I? I was young. I believe it was Elijah Jr. And it, it's just like in church. When you put some information out there, any anywhere on the streets, you can't control all of your followers. And some people think they'll get brownie points by doing something that as a leader you might not like. It's just like when you watch some of these rappers and they homeboy get into a fight. They might have told them, look, don't be fighting nobody. But as soon as they get out there, they get the puff shirt because they are, they they represent um, a rap star and they get to fighting. And of course, the rapper gets blamed. I believe a lot of that happened in the nation. I do. I believe a lot of that happened. But I also believe that it was the biggest brain screw. It was the biggest um, brainwash for us as black people who were looking for a way to be delivered out of the white man's hell. And what we were sold was just another cult, another pipe dream in terms of what our liberation would be. So I'm at the point now where I, I just got to speak for myself when I say this. Religion is the opium of the people. Religion split my family right down the middle. And until 50 years later, maybe 45, 50 years later, was I able um, I would say 45 years later to um, even get an acknowledgement from Farrakhan from all the people that were hurt by that assassination. And here we are, all adults, grandparents, grandparents, and in some cases, great-grandparents, and we're still dealing with the trauma and the secrecy and the the out and outright bullying that the nation has done to most of us that were members. But then they call the white man the devil. I'm like, who has been traumatized more than black people? So why would you traumatize your own people even more? Bombing Malcolm's house with little babies in the house, I remember that. I remember my father being so angry and so upset that I didn't understand it, but I do now. What kind of group, what kind of organization, what kind of, I mean, who would stand by and allow that to happen? And it's all because. He told the truth. Y'all took the man's house away. Took his money away. Put him on silence. He wasn't able to speak. Oh, what you want to go work at McDonald's? After he's been the national spokesperson? Huh? Is that what some of y'all wanted? Even in church. When you look at the atrocity. Uh, Bishop Eddie Long. I mean, people can fix their mouth to get you to not okay it, but to downplay it and forget about the victims of all that abuse. 
I'm not saying that you can't forgive these people. But they must be exposed. You don't heal. You can't face, you can't fix what you can't fix. And what happened to Malcolm? Y'all making excuses for any long. I'm going, I know I'm jumping around. I can name a thousand preachers. From them sticking bottles and objects up people's rectum to having wives and impregnating the women in the church. I've seen it all growing up as a kid. None of y'all know better than the other one. All of y'all are the same as far as I'm concerned. And you're going to tell me I can't sing? You're going to tell me I can't uh, do the things and be myself because I'm going to hell? That's why I'm so glad that when I my father turned his back on me because I turned my back on all that religion. All of it. Because in my mind, it is the opening of the people. It is the crack of society. Not having a, a healthy a relationship with God, but being a zealot, being a follower, that stuff can't lead you nowhere but to a dark place. And I know a lot of y'all mad at me. I really don't care. I've lived in secrecy long enough. And like I said, if you ask me, all they ask is, all of them are crocs of crap. Good you found something to make you turn your life around. But this is the biggest narcissistic trap. Anybody that want to get involved with narcissists and don't know what it is, narcissism, Join a religion. Join a religion. And that's all I want to say right now. I'm done. If you like what you hear, like, subscribe, and share my channel. And I'll see you in the next video.